This lecture is going to introduce the, the um, Gaussian mixture model. We will um, only talk about the univariate case in this lecture. There'll be a subsequent lecture that covers the multivariate case. So I think the best way to uh, introduce this model is with an example. So uh, suppose that we observe this histogram of data. So clearly there are two modes. Um, looks like there's a, you know, a large concentration of values. These points down here ind indicate individual values. So there's a large concentration of, of points out here that are large and another concentration of points that are small. Okay, so the question is, how, how did this, um, this histogram come about? Well, the Gaussian mixture model is going to hypothesize that the way this came about is that it is a mixture of two or more Gaussian distributions, but the labels have been lost. Okay, so in particular, what we're going to assume is that, uh, you know, in this case, I, I, I've cooked up the data. Um, we, we're going to assume that we have two Gaussian distributions. Now, the parameters of these distributions are shown in the upper left. Um, let's call this uh, distribution number zero. And distribution zero has a mean of zero and a standard deviation of a half. Uh, distribution one, you'll see, has a mean of three and it, uh, the standard deviation is one. So it's much more heterogeneous than this one. So th th the idea is simply this. Um, you know, we've got these two um, distributions one with smaller mean, one with greater mean, and we've observed some points from them, but the way to think about it is we, we lost the ability to identify whether the observation was a zero or, or a one, you know, from the zero distribution to the one distribution, and therefore we've observed this bimodal um, distribution. Okay, so the task that we have with uh, a Gaussian mixture model is to start with this histogram and recover the uh, the two these are called class conditional distributions so so the distributions that got mixed to create this now there is one other uh, thing that we need to comp uh, to recover and that is um, let's call it the the mixing ratio so uh, it appears if we look down at this observed histogram that the right mode is more common than the left mode. So, uh, you know, it's like there's a greater probability that, that points have come from the, the uh, one distribution than the zero distribution. Um, the way we're going to characterize is that, that with, is with a posterior probability. So, in fact, I've, uh, since I rigged the data in this problem, uh, eta is two-thirds. So what that means is there's a two-thirds probability that any a point selected at random from the population comes from this top distribution, a one-third probability that they come from the you know, distribution number zero, the one that's lower mean and a little more uh, homogenous. All right, so, so that's, um, that's kind of an introduction to what we're trying to do. We're trying to recover these two class conditional distributions as well as the mixing proportion or posterior probability, uh, which in this case is two-thirds. Let's go back to the beginning of the lecture and um, kind of walk through this a little more systematically. So we have to assume that we have a certain number of you know, underlying distributions. So K, big K is going to indicate the number of underlying distributions that we're mixing. Now, uh, we're going to assume that we've observed some random variables, call them x naughts and x ones, from each of these distributions. So this would be that lower uh, distribution. This would be the upper distribution, uh, consistent with my the example that I show later. Um, however, we don't really get to observe the x naughts or the x ones. Instead, we observe an x. Now, x is going to be dependent on some other um, random variable y. Now, y. Um, is going to take a value 0 or 1. Okay, so um, 
note that y also has a probability of, of equaling one of eta. All right, so eta fraction of the time we get ones. Now, um, what what is x then? So whenever y is one, well, it's just an x one. If y is zero, then okay, one minus zero is it's a, it's an x zero. Okay, so that's we observe these x's, and you know again our our, our goal here is to recover the uh, component distributions. Now, if they're Gaussian, all we need is the mean and the variance or standard deviation. So we're trying to recover these two parameters, the parameters of the other distribution, and the eta. So you can think about this two-class univariate Gaussian mixture has five parameters. Now, these distributions all have names. I've, I've been calling um, these, you know, the component distributions. Um, they're often called class conditional distributions. So, the, why class conditional? Well, if we know which class you're in, that is the shape of the distribution. Okay, so, what we're saying here is, uh, for a, uh, an observation of type little k, the PDF is going to be normal with mean mu k and standard deviation sigma sub k. Then the unconditional distribution, the thing that we've observed, so think of this as that bimodal histogram that we just observed, is just going to be a mixture of the two class conditional distributions with mixing proportion eta. Now, we've observed um, you know, n observations from this mixture, and we want to recover those five parameters. We'll do this with maximum likelihood. So if the observations are independent, we'll multiply the, um, the observed PDFs. Now we'll take the log of that product, uh, and, and therefore we get this sum. So, so this is our, like, our log likelihood function, and this is what we have to, um, to maximize. Uh, problem is, uh, direct maximization is very difficult. Um, there are no good starting values. And so what we usually tend to do is use the EM algorithm to, uh, to optimize this. So I'm not going to um, talk a lot about the EM algorithm, uh, but uh, I'll just kind of uh, give, give a flavor of, of, of how we're going to do this. It's, it's quite similar to the way we uh, estimated k-mean solutions. Um, the idea is we're going to take some initial guesses at these parameters. So uh, we're going to need some starting values. And uh, once we have those starting values, we're going to uh, go back and forth between trying to figure out which class uh, an observation comes from. So for a given x, we want to estimate the chance that... Um, that that observation comes from class one, then we also know the, the you know one minus that gives us the chance that that the observation comes from class zero, and we can do this with Bayes' theorem. So th this this is essentially Bayes' theorem. Now, once I've figured out which uh, which class uh, each observation comes from, conditional on these parameter values, I'm going to update my parameter values. Okay, then I, you know, now that I've re, um, re, you know, I've updated my parameter values, I come back and reassign uh, cases to the clusters using these, these, these are going to be called posterior probability shortly. Uh, and, and I keep doing this until I, um, uh, you know, my algorithm converges. So there are no uh, changes to the, the likelihood function value. So that's about all I want to say about the EM algorithm. There's some uh, additional references if you want to read a little bit more on that. Now I've written um, a, a, a short R function to implement that EM algorithm. I, I think whenever you learn a method for the first time, it's it's healthy to code it in um, you know R for, for at least a simple case. Often um, 
more general cases become much more difficult. But uh, you can get a, a feel for what's going on by coding it for a, a simple case, as we have here with only two classes and univariate distributions. All right, well, let's go apply my function to this example. Now, I would like to point out a few things about this code. Uh, so I'm going to set the seed. And by setting the seed, what this means is that we're going to get you know, a fixed sequence of random numbers. If you set the seed, you will get the exact same data as I have, and your results should be the same. Now, we're going to generate um, some values. So x is going to be um, you know, a vector with two pieces. So we're going to first generate 100 random values with a mean of 0 and a standard deviation of, of 1 half. And we'll concatenate another 200 values. So this is how I'm going to simulate um, values from the second distribution being more common. So we'll take 100 from the 0 distribution, 200 from the 1 distribution. This has a mean of 0, standard deviation of 1. Now, just for illustration purposes, I'm going to record the labels. In real life, you don't get to see these. To create these graphs, I used Lattice. And so the plot up here was created with this, this command. We want to create a density plot of x, and we want to break it out by y. And so that's how I broke it out. Now, to um, uh, get the graph in the lower right of the um, figure, we drop the conditioning. So if I just say, give me a density plot of x, this gives it to us. All right. If I call up my um, binary mix function on the previous page, uh, here's what we get. Converges in 50 iterations, certain uh, negative 2 log likelihood, and uh, here are the parameter estimates. So the first two values of the mean, recall that I've rigged it so the mean was 0 and 3. Well, we're pretty close. Um, the standard deviations were 1 half and 1. Well, again, we're fairly close. And then this is eta, the mixing proportion, which should have been 2 thirds. 0.65 is pretty close. All right. Um, note the sensitivity to starting values. If you give it a different seed, you will get a very different solution, and it's not a very good one. Notice the negative 2 log likelihood is, um, uh, or deviance here, is, is a bit larger than the other one. So we would prefer uh, this first solution. What you want to do is um, run this multiple times with different starting values and uh, choose the one that has the best, um, best deviance. Now there is a package in R called mclust. You can click up on the heading here and you can be brought to documentation on this. Uh, so you first have to install mclust from the CRAN site. Once you've got it installed, every time you want to use it, you want to type library mclust with a little m. Now we can estimate a, a Gaussian mixture model with the big M clust function. So fit will be some fitted object, and this will be a fit of, of X. The, the parameter G specifies the number of components that you wish to extract. So let's pull out two. Now when you plot it, you get a series of plots. So we might as well go into R for a second. And you'll see that I've already estimated this. If I say plot fit, um, first plot we're going to get is going to display uh, the BIC value for different models. And so we're going to learn about this shortly. Um, this is equal variances or variable variances, meaning different variances across the two. We're going to see the variable variances fits better. So that's the one that it chose. This is going to be called a classification plot. And so the idea of a classification plot is all values that are uh, red get assigned to one distribution. All values that are blue get assigned to the other. This was the original distribution that we observed. So in other words, any value, it looks like this must be about one and a half or so. Any value less than one and a half gets assigned to the blue distribution, anything greater than one and a half gets assigned to the red distribution. This is something called the uncertainty plot. 
So the uncertainty plot um, is, is really one minus the largest posterior probability. So in other words, if we observe a value of three, we're almost certain that it comes from the right distribution. So there's you know the, the height of this curve, one minus that largest posterior probability, which is 0.999 something or other, it's gonna be close to zero. What it's saying here is around one, one and a half, we're not quite sure where to put the, um, the cases. So it's, uh, you can make a case for either, either red or blue. Um, this is the estimated density based on those components. So you'll see why it has a hard time separating out those cases around one and a half. All right, now we can uh, recover the parameters with fit dollar parameter dollar pro. Let's go back here for a second. If you just dollar, if you just say fit dollar parameter, uh, you get all the parameters. So the proportions, roughly two thirds get assigned to the you know, second class, 35% um, get assigned to the first class. Here are the means, those means roughly match what my little function gave. And then here are your variances. Actually, those, yeah, those are variances. Uh, just, um, just for fun, it's kind of note, it's fun, kind of fun to note the bias of k-means. So with, uh, with k-means, what you're going to see is that because um, the clusters have unequal size, so remember, the right cluster was twice as large as the left one, uh, there's going to be a bias towards making these have equal size. And sure enough, that's what we see. So we see 60% of the cases going into one of the clusters instead of 40%. Um, what happens is the mean of the, um, uh, of the smaller cluster gets pushed out so that it can swallow up observations from the other one. Uh, you'll also see that the, um, you know, the within cluster standard deviation is inflated a bit in order to swallow up more cases from the other one. So we see a little bit of a bias with k-means, not a terrible bias. All right, one more point on this. Um, let's, let's talk in more depth about the posterior distribution. So, so the way I, I like to think about this is there's really a couple uh, distributions that we care about. The distributions are uh, the observed distribution, the class conditional distributions, the prior distribution tells the mixing proportion from these two. Um, the last of those distributions gonna, is the posterior distribution. So the posterior distribution simply says for a given x, uh, what is the probability that you come from class one or from class zero? Now we can work out these posterior probabilities with, uh, with the version of Bayes' theorem. So this is the formula that we used back in the EM algorithm. Um, an interesting question is, for which values of x should we assign uh, to group 1? Now, we could just assign them whenever, well, the short answer is assign, uh, assign it to group 1 whenever the posterior probability of it belonging to group 1 exceeds the posterior probability that it belongs to group 0. These posterior probabilities, I've written them both down here, must sum to uh, 1. Now, uh, there's a variety of ways that you can answer this question algebraically. I decided to work with odds. So whenever the odds exceed 1 is an equivalent uh, way to formulate the problem. Um, I suppose you could just do it directly also. One is one posterior probability greater than the other. Uh, regardless of how you do this, so we do a little bit of algebra, you end up with a quadratic, which is kind of curious. Now let's take a look at this quadratic. Quadratic says we're going to assign observations to class 1 whenever x is greater than 1. Okay, that makes total sense because the mean is substantially greater. Or when x is less than minus 3. Now this is, this is quite odd. So, so what's going on with this? Well, let's go look at a graph of the original distribution. So these are the distributions if, if I knew the truth. And we've got a blue distribution to the right and a red distribution to the left. Now, 
the, the basic idea is we want to assign a, an observation to the blue distribution whenever you know, the posterior probability is higher. So we, we've, I've graphed the posterior probabilities directly underneath it. And so what you'll see is that for values greater than about one or so, uh, we're going to assign it to the blue distribution because that, that's the posterior probability of you know, being from the blue distribution. For values less than one, it's going to get assigned to the red distribution. So just to talk through this, let's say my x were two. Some person has a two. Well, there's not much of a chance that person would have come from the red distribution. There's quite a substantial chance that this person came from the blue. And so that's why the posterior probability that a 2 is nearly you know, 1. We're almost certain that guy comes from a 1. Now, what's happening out here at minus 3? Well, the problem is we have different variances. Now, because the variances are different, uh, the tails go to zero at a different rate. So the, the more dispersed distribution, the blue one, is going to go to zero more slowly than the red one. And so we can't really see it on this picture, but at the value 3, um, the blue distribution crosses the red distribution again, uh, because that blue, dis that blue tails go into zero more quickly and that's why they, they, they cross. Now, uh, from a marketing point of view, it would be silly to start sending the blue offer to anybody who was uh, less than minus three. There aren't many people out there anyway, but if we encountered some, that would not be a good decision. So that's, that's a little quirk about this um, Gaussian mixture model when you have unequal variances. All right, uh, you should try to do the old faithful problem uh, on your own at this point.